This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a special guest, the new Libertarian Party candidate or leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada, Tim Mohn. And uh, I have a few friends who actually have uh, been talking to him over the past, and they told me I had to have him on. Um, and uh, actually, I had the past uh, Libertarian Party of Canada leader, uh, uh, Katie Chown, on. And uh, the, actually, when she was on with us, I don't know if anyone remembers, but she was pregnant, and now she's had her baby, and and I guess she's decided to move on. So Tim has taken her place. And uh, one of the memes that Tim has that uh, caught a lot of attention is uh, he put out a thing and it says, I want gay married couples to be able to protect their marijuana plants with guns. And so that's great. So a very interesting guy, great stuff. Uh, we're going to get into all that and, uh, and also about politics. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Tim, how did you become an anarchist? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, and I think it's important to, to kind of define what anarchist uh, means. You know, there, there might be some people in the political realm out there who are having a heart attack right now. Uh, the leader of a libertarian party, the guy that I trust is an anarchist. He wants to create anarchy. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess my, my, my uh, you know, I, I look at anarchy as kind of uh, the same as atheism. You know, it, it's in a sense, just uh, a non-belief. It's not a positive belief system so much as it's uh, a belief, a, a lack of belief in the extraordinary claims of other people. So um, I came to, to uh, embrace kind of libertarianism and anarchy as, uh, you know, from the perspective of a skeptic. I was actually uh, went through a period in my life where I started to question the faith of my childhood and the kind of the indoctrination of my childhood. And I, uh, you know, I learned to think more like a skeptic and I, and I learned, you know, I came to realize that, that, that all my beliefs, including my religious ones, had been implanted there by, by my environment, that I didn't come to them rationally. I didn't, they, they weren't, uh, you know, emergent from some rational uh, thinking or the evidence that was produced to me. It was, I was born in a particular area to a particular family in a particular environment. And that's why I had those beliefs. And if I had been born somewhere else, I'd have completely different beliefs about the nature of reality. And so I first became, you know, an atheist. I, I, I lost my uh, faith in, in the religion of my childhood. And then uh, I started questioning, well, what other beliefs uh, do I have that aren't congruent with reality? And, uh, you know, I, all the people that I was uh, looking to, probably the most, most influential in my life was probably Penn Jillette, actually, because, uh, you know, I came across him through his atheist rants and he started talking about this liberty stuff and uh i started realizing that uh that that it, it really defined what i was because i had always kind of been uh, you know socially liberal and fiscally conservative in my my political thinking so that fit perfectly with with what i was thinking i had a name to put on it and uh and i just kind of followed that rabbit down the, the path you know its path and i said yeah there there is no way you can make a claim Someone can make a legitimate claim for initiating violence against someone else to get things done in the world. I mean, you can make a claim that that you have the right to use protective force to, to respond to violence, but you can't use violence to get your way. And, and someone who makes that claim, which is what the statists do, uh, it, they ha the onus is on them. The burden of proof is on them. And I still haven't seen evidence to prove that. Um, and, and I'm open to hearing it. You know, I, I would love to, to be a status quo sheeple in a way. Uh, it's, it'd make my life a lot less, uh, you know, it, 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 a lot easier. I'd be able to fit in a lot more in, in different groups and circles that I, in my community. But uh, fortunately, I just can't subscribe to superstition and, and, you know, I need that evidence. So. Yeah, I think you're going to be waiting a while to hear really good evidence on how statism will ever work uh, uh, well. Um, just out of curiosity, well, you said you used to uh, be part of a religion. Were you part of that cannibal cannibalistic death cult, uh, Catholic, 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 excuse me, Catholicism? <laughs> no, no, those we never considered those guys to be real Christians. Uh, you know, they they were they worshipped their pope and their thing. We worshipped the real God. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how all religions is. And, and in fact, that's how kind of all statists are, right? They, they project their own uh, identity, what appeals to them, what emotionally appeals to them onto this non-existent entity called the state. 
and that becomes the God uh, that everyone needs to follow. And we have the one true God, it's the Democrat God. And, you know, we want mummy in charge. And on the right, we want daddy in charge. And, um, and so, you know, I kind of see, see my activism and my role uh, in, you know, in all this is, it, it, it's deeper than, than promoting liberty. It goes into, you know, because I don't want people to, uh, to come to their conclusions uh, through, you know, I don't want them to come to the right conclusions by a, a broken process, right? So, so if you, you know, if you believe that, uh, if you if you think you've found some evidence that government is scanning your brain waves, and now that causes you to become a libertarian, well, I, I would rather, uh, you know, I have more in common with a person who who um, approaches things from reason and evidence, and and has, uh, you know, kind of that. It, what you know, philosopher Peter Bogosian would call uh, doxastically open approach to the world. In other words, you're non-dogmatic. You you have a system for revising your beliefs. So if you be, if you are using bad evidence or bad thinking to reach your conclusions, you might accidentally get right every now and then. But hey, if it turns out that the government isn't scanning your brain waves and someone can show you that evidence, does that mean now you're going to not be a libertarian? And uh, and so you know. I, I, I would prefer people to look at the process they use to align their beliefs with reality. I think that's that's more important than necessarily reaching the same conclusions. Because eventually, you'll reach this. The, people will generally reach the same conclusions if they have that process. But if they're devoid of that process, they'll be subject to fall for uh, anything that comes along, and and they'll sway in the wind like everyone else. Yeah, I agree. And uh, one of the things that uh, Larkin Rose talks a lot about. Um, and that I totally believe is the biggest religion on earth right now is statism, the belief in government. Uh, it is, uh, it's by far the biggest one. And the, the worst part about it is that most people don't see it as religion. They actually uh, just, uh, for whatever reason, the brainwashing and indoctrination camps or all, you know, whatever it is, they just think of it as, as uh, not being a religion. So it's really hard to sort of convince them that it is. And one of the things that I've been telling people lately, I, I meet a lot of people and I ask them about their beliefs and a lot of people will say, politically, I'm an atheist. And then I say, well, that's an anarchist because that is what an anarchist is, a, a non-belief in the political system. Uh, where you're at now was really interesting. So um, before you, were you ever, what were you like a conservative before or a liberal or anything like that? You know, I probably would have, uh, would have thrown in with the liberal camp, you know, things like, uh, people starving and poverty and all the things that kind of uh, that that um, left wing people type care about those are the things I care about I'm worried about the environment I'm worried about so th those those are the kinds of things that I, I would generally be concerned about and so I, I probably would have thrown in with uh, with the liberals uh, in the past so how did you come to being the leader of the libertarian party you must have um, so you never really did subscribe fully to uh, the the uh, left-right paradigm. Uh, at what point did you sort of realize what libertarianism was and became involved with the Libertarian Party? Well, like I said, I came across it, you know, through the, the kind of writings and rantings of, of Penn Jillette, and then I, you know, went down the rabbit hole with Ayn Rand and and Rothbard and all these other ones. And you know, I, I probably would have considered myself a, a minarchist in terms of, you know, there's there's a, a particular size of government that's just the right size, and that's what we need to protect our liberty. And uh, and then it was probably another six months later where I realized, well, that that doesn't necessarily follow. I mean, if 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 people can provide those services in a free market, why wouldn't we let them? And uh, and so I kind of uh, got rid of that. And now, you know, I would even say, um, and this is something maybe we can talk about a little later, is, you know, I, I'm. I don't think there's any endpoint called Libertopia or Ancapistan or uh, I think that that I've just kind of come to accept that there's there's people like you and me that are always going to be kind of outliers that kind of shun the status quo and are looking for ways to improve liberty. And so I think that if we reach this this, you know, place called and, you know, where there's no aggression in the world, where there's no physical aggression. Uh, I don't think that's an endpoint. I think there's probably ways we can get better. I mean, for example, you know, I, I did uh, a graduate uh, degree and, and I studied uh, self-organizing fire teams. And 
and so I came across a lot of research in there uh, that talks about, you know, that kind of changed my perception of the world. Um, so, you know, I kind of came to view, frame every system as essentially self-organizing. Uh, you know, the, the universe is bottom up, things emerge for a reason. You know, the government emerges not because uh, necessarily there's people running around with guns. Uh, there's not very many people running around with guns compared to the amount of people that are being ruled. It's actually the belief system of, of the population of the people in a system that cr that that from which government emerges and these people with guns are allowed to, to do their thing so uh, you know the, the the thing we have the hierarchy we have is kind of an emergent property of, of people's belief system and so once I, I kind of understood that it kind of changed the way I, I approached a lot of things in life you know including my parenting including uh, my activism and including you know uh, how I am in relationships and business relationships and different things like that and it kind of opened up a lot of doors and, and uh, created a lot of opportunities for me and, and, and this is one of those opportunities um, you know I was convinced by uh, you know I, in fact probably about a year or two ago I wrote an article that basically uh, talked about voting being borderline immoral I mean I said you, may, you could maybe paint a case for voting as an act of self-defense but uh, if you're engaging in this you know suggestion box on a plantation as Molyneux puts it uh, you're kind of contributing and reinforcing the system and you're basically you know it's almost beneath human dignity to talk about how you want to be ruled to, to engage in that process and so it was it took a lot of convincing to get me to to engage in politics and it was uh, a few people that I know that are active in the party and active in the liberty movement that said, you know, we think you'd be a good candidate for uh, running for office and we think that we need a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, politician or movement up here that 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 kind of uh, coalesces people and stimulates the liberty movement like Ron Paul did in the States. And, he, and, and the, the argument was put forward that you can't argue that Ron Paul hurt the liberty movement in his political activities. And he certainly didn't do anything to shrink government in terms of getting the reins of power and then being able to shrink it. Um, but he did spread a message. And so, uh, you know, I, I look at how am I going to connect with people? How am I going to change government? How am I going to create liberty? Well, the way to do that is by connecting with people, by getting the message out there, uh, by stopping, you know, sitting around liberty circles, kind of circle jerking and actually go do something and be somebody, right? And, uh, and this was an opportunity that presented itself to me and, and uh, it, you know, it's certainly not the only way or even the best way, but it, it's, I think it's up to the individual to look at the opportunities they have in front of them and find a way to, to connect with people and change their hearts and minds because changing hearts and minds is what's really important. That's, that's what's gonna change uh, society. That's what's gonna change government and create, give us more liberty. Yeah, not changing hearts and minds in the way that George Bush had in mind with bombs and tanks. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, it's it's really interesting that you said that you were a minarchist and then six months later you essentially were an anarchist. I don't know if you've heard that saying, but the only difference between a minarchist and an anarchist is six months. And that's that I've heard it so many times. It really is uh, very... Uh, 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 it's quite true. Uh, so right. many people, and that, and that's sort of one of the interesting things about this whole thing, uh, is uh, you brought up Ron Paul. Uh, so many people got into. I, I have, we're on Anarchast right now. I've had on over 140 anarchists. I think Ron Paul is probably the number one person that people have said that brought them to anarchy. But he wasn't necessarily talking about anarchism. Uh, he was very close, mm. and I'm still to this day not sure if he's a total anarchist. I don't think he right. is, but he's 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 pr about as close as you can get without well, being it, one. Well, it's it's politically, um, you know, and I'm I'm probably committing political suicide even by coming on your show, right? <laughs> but you know, I I. When when I set out to do this, I said it's important to be authentic and, and true to myself and to not become one of these, you know, because I could see very clearly how someone engaged in this process becomes a sociopath, puts their own personality, their own authentic self, compartmentalizes that to tell people what they want to hear. And even with myself being aware of all this and, and you know, I wear this, uh, <laughs> I'm a giant nerd, so I wear this ring, it's the Ring of Power uh, replica from, from Lord of the Rings, it's my, it's my wedding ring. Uh, because I want to remind myself of the power I hold over people like my children, like my wife, my, like other people in my life. I have this power that um, that I could kind of have my way if I wanted to. And, and, 
uh, and it's the same with, uh, with the political process. You know, I think it's very important to be cognizant of that, that kind of corrupting influence of, of power. And, but you can see how people kind of become sociopaths in this process. And so I'm making, you know, it was a kind of a conscious effort. I had to overcome a little bit of resistance in my mind to, to appear on your show even because, uh, because I know there's going to be some people out there that won't understand what I'm saying and, and will just see me as someone that's trying to destroy uh, what they hold so dear. And, and that's not what I want. In fact, you know, if we were to dissolve the government tomorrow, I don't think it would be necessarily a good thing. I don't think that that from that would emerge all this prosperity and and growth necessarily. I think because we what we ha what we have gotten rid of is simply uh, the people holding the guns, right? We haven't gotten rid of the belief system called statism. Like there's not this thing called government that exists. People use it like it's a material entity. They talk about government does this, government does that, the state this, the state that. Well, no, there, there's people doing that, and there will be more people doing that. Um, because you haven't changed the belief system. There's a demand. There's kind of a market demand almost for, uh, for violence. And so what we need to do is, is change the market demand. And, and one of the things that's kind of a problem in the liberty movement right now is that we have, in a lot of ways, our rhetoric offers nothing positive to people. All we have is negativity. We're focused on uh, government's bad. That's bad. That's terrible. That's a horrible idea you have. Uh, we sit here, you know, and, and, and try to criticize people. And we really offer nothing positive of value. Uh, and, and uh, you know, to be a change agent in a self-organizing system, what you have to do is, is create something of value. And this is something I learned with my kids. Like, it, for the first couple of years of my activism, I was still a terrible parent. You know, I, I would use force against my kids. You know, I wasn't practicing non-aggression with them. I would use punishments, uh, like go to your room, or I'm taking this or doing that. Uh, to try to manipulate them to behave the way I wanted to be. I was a, I was a blatant statist in, as a parent. And no wonder my activism wasn't bearing any fruit, right? Because I had nothing positive to offer. I didn't know how to, how to apply non-aggression principle to my own life. And, and the non-aggression principle is just the start, I believe. I, I think that, there's, that we need to find another gear. And, uh, and that is connect people with value. So do things like, you know, you provide people with value through your, your work, uh, you know, you, you, involved with Galt's Gulch, involved with investing in stuff that uh, takes advantage of, of uh, the chaos government throws into it. And, and you're providing a way for people to live more freely. And I think that, that activists can take a lesson from that and, and learn how to provide value. So as a parent, uh, you know, once I took force off the table with my kids, things didn't automatically just get better. There, there was still all this kind of learned behavior and negativity in the family that that, uh, you know, and, and kids would still do things that, that might be unsafe or not proper behavior or whatever. And, and so I found myself thinking, okay, what I need to do is just use protective force. So I'll use protective force when the kids are doing something that is dangerous. And so then I'd start playing this game, okay, I, my parenting became all about the use of force. And this is something I see in the liberty movement right now. It's all about when can we use force? When can I, and I, I wasn't providing any value to my kids doing that. Like they, I wasn't causing them any more harm, but I wasn't being a change agent in their life. I wasn't creating positive change uh, and, and creating more liberty for them. So in order to create liberty, you have to take force off the table. Of course, that's the first step. But then you also have to provide va value to people so that they have more choices and options available to themselves. And in producing more liberty for them, you also produce more liberty for yourself. It's, it's kind of like being a company owner. You know, I always try to run my companies with, you know, uh, I, I don't like to, to rent people's time so much as I want them to be uh, engaged in owning the company. And I want to teach them how to homestead their piece of the company because there's an unlimited amount of homesteading that can be done and property that can be owned within, within this organization. And uh, I want them to own that. I don't want, uh, you know, and, and, and in doing so, we all profit handsomely from that. So it's kind of the same way with parenting. And, and so that's the kind of mentality that I kind of want to bring to the liberty movement uh, is, is, okay, we're taking force off the table. Now we have to switch gears and think about how do we actually provide value to people? What kind of positive uh, thing can we give? Because right now we're like the wind trying to blow that cloak of statism off them. And we kind of need to be, I believe, more like the sun and attract them and, and get them to drop their guard and drop their cloak and drop all their dogmas and embrace liberty because of the empowering message it has. Yeah, I think uh, 
Great points, by the way, all very genuine. I don't think this is going to be political suicide for you by being on a show called Anarchist and saying you're an anarchist. And here's the reason why. It's because, uh, first of all, there's a lot of things changing right now. Um, and uh, another thing I should say, too, is uh, that uh, when you say you're a libertarian, that really is an anarchist. If you say sure. you're a libertarian, if you truly believe in freedom, then you should want no ruler at all to rule you. And that is right. what an anarchist is. Um, but the reason I think that you have actually great potential um, is because Canada, is a, for people who don't know Canada, it's, a, it's sort of a funny place. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's different than the U.S. for sure, uh, uh, the way the people are. Uh, the, the politicians that they've elected in the past, people like Pierre Trudeau, who was constantly giving the finger to the press, uh, Jean Chrétien, who when someone kind of like bumped into him at a thing, he punched him in the face. Um, people like in uh, Alberta, uh, where you're from, and I'm from as well, uh, people like Ralph Klein, who was like an open, raging alcoholic doing crazy stuff. Uh, people didn't mind that. And then you look at Rob Ford in Toronto, yeah. he's, probably the, he's probably the most popular politician in, in uh, Canada, if not uh, all over the place. Place, and he's completely insane. Uh, so it, uh, the yeah. Canadian people aren't totally uh, against having politicians that are a little bit off the beaten track. Sure. And um, so I think there's actually a massive opportunity for you here. And uh, just by looking at you, I've never seen you in person. You actually have that politician look. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it is a, to an extent that's what uh, uh, politics is, especially at the presidential or prime minister level. It's really a, a fashion show or a who, who looks the best. <laughs> And and you, you actually have that look, and the way you talk is excellent. Uh, very, uh, the sort of the way that a lot of people would like to hear politicians talk. Uh, um, I think you have a massive potential. So tell me about what you think about. I think there's the uh, and sorry for all the people who aren't Canadian. There's a lot of a, a boots being thrown about here. But do the boot. <laughs> but um, what's your thoughts? There's a federal election coming up next year, I believe. Um, what's your thoughts about the uh, uh, potential for the Libertarian Party? Uh, in making some headway in that election? Well, I think, I think there's some good potential. And, and I kind of have uh, a different metric maybe than some people because I think some people who engage in politics think that the be-all, end-all is, is getting into power. And like I said before, getting into power for us, uh, it, you know, we, it's not like we can get into power tomorrow and uh, form a libertarian government and start repealing laws because people people will revolt. They, they won't stand for that. They, you, to start taking away free stuff, things that they're dependent on, it's like heroin, right? You can't just remove heroin from an addict and expect that they're not going to try everything in their power to get heroin again. They'll just go to a different pusher. Uh, and so, you know, we can't, you know, government lags behind the belief system. So what, what we need to do is, is change the parade, change the belief system, change the movement of people towards more liberty and then the government I think will follow. Uh, I think it'll, it'll kind of lag behind and, and you'll get these people who are kind of vacuous sociopaths who are just interested in getting power and it'll be there in their self-interest to get in front of the parade of liberty and they'll just kind of parrot whatever they think people want them to hear. And, and so my goal is not so much, um, you know, get getting votes as it is changing hearts and minds and I think that uh, that you know, there's research out there that shows that when 10% of people in a society have an unshakable belief in something, that this, the zeitgeist, that the paradigm of that society shifts. And so the magic number to me is that 10%. That's that's my goal to reach out and change the minds of at least 10% uh, of the population. Within my own riding in the last by-election, I, I got 5% of the vote in the city of Fort McMurray, and. Uh, so that tells me that that I'm halfway to my goal in Fort McMurray because you know libertarianism that the, the subscription to the non-aggression principle is you know, we're modern day abolitionists in a sense uh, we uh, you know once you become an abolitionist once you accept the moral argument that there shouldn't be slavery you don't go back to kind of arguing about uh, how to get in, in charge of the plantation and how it should be managed and stuff like that so. So the first step for me is, is changing that, getting that 10% of people believing in an unshakable belief of liberty. Uh, the, the other parties don't have any kind of rooted principle. They just kind of blow in the wind with whatever they're feeling or, or whatever they're worried about in the moment and 
glom onto some, but we have that anchor. So we actually have a, a tactical advantage, I think, in that our message is rooted. But we have to be careful not to start hunting votes because as soon as you start hunting votes, you start saying things that people, that you think people want to hear. So it's about keeping a principled message and changing that 10% and, and not getting votes at the expense of telling people subtle lies and, and selling them a product that they didn't think that they weren't aware of. You know, I don't want people voting for me uh, and then hating me because I'm, I'm promoting liberty as soon as I get in office. Uh, I don't think that gets us anywhere. So, so that's my underlying goal is to get that 10%. Now, the other thing we, we uh, can do is, you know, once we get into office, so right now we're creating an organization. We, we have, you know, the, the last by-election and kind of the press that we've been getting in, in Canada now as a result of my campaign and some of the activities that have been going on. Uh, are drawing some people in and I pr predict there's going to be an exponential growth in the party and in the liberty movement in Canada. Uh, I, I just have that sense. There's more and more people coming and wanting to be plugged in and figuring out how to be active. So we're, we're forming teams right now and the, the goal is to prepare for the 2015 election because that's a giant stage, right? That we have a giant stage, you know, I'm going to be going you know, we're going to frame it as I'm going head to head with Harper and Trudeau and Mulcair and all these other giant parties. And, uh, and and that's going to draw attention to the party. And then once we draw the attention to the party, that's our goal to, to communicate the message as effectively as possible. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're going to get into power and form a libertarian government very soon. But I do think that we're going to be very effective at drawing people in to the to the message of liberty. And at the end of the day, uh, when people are drawn to that message, uh, the government's going to change uh, regardless of whether it's a guy who calls himself a liberal or a conservative. Those sociopaths are going to have to uh, have to abide by the people that that put them there. And if the message the people want is more liberty, then that, that's what they're going to have to get. And one of the things that that, you know, I want minarchists and people that believe in limited government to understand is that I share the exact same goal as you. I want to shrink government down and, you know, that you actually probably have more in common with me, an anarchist, than you do with other minarchists because there's no minarchists I've met that can agree on what exactly the size of government should be. Uh, some people think it should be a thousand, some people think it should be 15,000. So if you're one of those guys that thinks it should be a thousand, you're closer to my belief that it should be maybe one person eventually uh, than, than you are to the other guy. Uh, there's no end point. We're going to have to go through a stage probably of minarchy before we reach anarchy or else you know, it's just going to be chaotic and we're going to have to form pockets of like-minded people and protect ourselves from the barbarian hordes. But <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, very interesting. And you're very pragmatic. And uh, pretty much everything you're saying is sort of what I think Ron Paul was trying to do. He, I don't think he was trying to win the presidential election when he was doing it. He was just trying to spread these ideas and it worked amazingly well. And so I hope you get the same opportunities. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't follow politics, of course, and I, I haven't lived in Canada in uh, nearly 15 years, um, but um, is there going to be any sort of uh, debates that you might be able to get involved on on a national level to sort of do this exact same thing that Ron Paul was doing? Well, I, you know, that's a good question. I mean, we're, we're going to have to, you know, this is part of why I, we need help, right? You know, if, you, if you've just been one of these people who have kind of disdained and turned your nose up at at being involved in the political process. First of all, understand there's no such thing as the political process or government. It's, it's just people organizing, right? It's, it, you know, we tend to think dichotomize and think that people in government or politicians are somehow different than us and they're, they're not. So we can organize anywhere in society, uh, you know, with this idea of liberty and, and go everywhere with it. So, but this is an effective way, I believe. I've come to see that, you know, I was a big skeptic of, of being involved in this type of thing. So, um, yes, we can, I think we can get on a national stage. It's going to be difficult. They're going to, you know, it's going to be really hard for us without doing a lot of, without making a lot of noise. So, you know, one of the things we thought about doing was just kind of pulling some stunts, like maybe, you know, Justin Trudeau is kind of the pretty boy liberal party guy. And he's been doing all these, these kind of uh, charity boxing matches against other politicians. So I thought, you know, I, I, I've never fought in my life and I'm not, but I, I would be willing to train MMA for the next <laughs> six months and challenge him to a charity MMA match, party leader to party leader. Uh, you know, uh, Harper is known for playing with his band and making, you know, being kind of a, a 
you know, maybe we can have a battle of the bands, me and Harper, or I can, you know, we can sit, issue a challenge. And Mulcair is known for his angry rant, rants <laughs> in Parliament, his angry face, and I can do some pretty angry rants. That's kind of how I started the Liberty Movement, was very <laughs> angry rants. So uh, I can, I, I think I can outdo them in all their, their sacred little, uh, you know, hobbies there and uh, and maybe draw some attention by just issuing challenges to them uh, to and, and get on the, the public radar that way. Maybe we could get enough. But what we need is, you know, right now I'm forming a communication team of people who are, are want to make videos and want to do blogs and want to get this message out there. And, you know, organizing together like this, we can be far more effective. So if, if you're looking for a place to, to do some work to promote liberty uh, in your Canada, or even if you're not, even if you want to contribute uh, and you're somewhere else, we can plug in and we can get you to work and working together, we can we can make a big uh, impact. That's great. Uh, I really like all those ideas. Um, and uh, you brought up a, a point that I want to just touch on a little bit more about how, uh, and I agree with you, that if, uh, for example, if uh, the libertarian or even an anarchist party gets elected and they just turn off the government tomorrow, that's not going to be perfect at all. Uh, it's actually would turn into complete chaos because so many people are so addicted to all of the statism in their lives, all of these social programs, all everything. So many people work for the government yeah. um, that it would it would cause a lot of chaos. It wouldn't be anarchy; <laughs> it'd be chaos. Yeah. Uh, it'd be it'd be the, uh, the chaos caused by statism and the ending of statism. Um, so I was I was wondering if you had any thoughts about let's let's say for example that this really starts to catch on. You, you do exactly what you say you're going to do. And actually, I have a, a good feeling you are going to. And uh, um, more people wake up and a libertarian party gets elected as the, as the party in Canada. Did you, do you have any thoughts, and I'm just brainstorming here, on how we could slowly unwind government so that it would be the least painful uh, for the, the least amount of people uh, to just unwind it all? Uh, because as I said before, if you just turn it off, it's going to be chaos, especially in a place like the U.S. Uh, where so many people, there's 50 million people on food stamps. Uh, the food stamps shut down in one state for about 12 hours mm -hmm. and it was a near riot. Um, so it's obviously you can't just turn this thing off. Um, but I was wondering if you've thought that far ahead as if, if you, if you did have some ability to change some of the things, how you would go about slowly unwinding the statism. Yeah, the, the, this is actually something that, that I've been thinking about and talking with other people in the party about, because, you know, we, as, as Liberty activists, we kind of have this, um, we, we view ourselves a lot of times as fighters. We're fighting a fight. And I don't think that's the most helpful metaphor or, or, or frame to come from. I think that, you know, I consider statism a mind virus and, and that we need to be physicians and, and healers here and connect people with value and healing as opposed to try to punch the, that statism out of their brain. And, and you can see this in the way libertarians uh, often, often conduct themselves online. It's all about, you know, quite often and, and this is going off on another tangent again. I'll come back to your point, but but quite often libertarians view themselves as like the reason you are able to subscribe so readily to libertarianism is because you're used to being kind of alone. This is my this is kind of my speculation based on meeting other people in the liberty movement. We've kind of been ostracized our whole life. Like you don't see a lot of uh, prom queens and and star athletes uh, becoming libertarians. It's just too much at stake for them. They, so so there's a group of people that are you know, just going to be, it's going to cost them too much to become libertarian. And so, but because we've come from this, there, there's a pro and con to having been ostracized. The pro is we're able to think for ourselves. We don't engage in group think. Uh, we're able to reason and evidence and, and think our way through some of these irrational beliefs. But the downside is that we're terrible at connecting with people and we're terrible at social situations. And we think that now that we finally have this weapon called the truth, and a bulletproof philosophy. Now I can change the world. Now I can just bat people over the head with it, fight the fight, and get back at them. And and that empirically doesn't work. Um, we need to to get past that. We need to, to to see ourselves not as victims, but as as powerful people, as people that have a cure, that have that are physicians that are able to provide value. We need to get out of this victim mentality that I see popping up all the time of constantly fighting other people and trying to bat them over the head with reason and evidence. I do believe there's a time, by the way, to, to use tough talk and to 
put put aggressive people back on their heels. You know, I kind of like to refer to that communication as protective communication. But uh, you know, I like to you know one of the books that really changed my minds on the, on this was uh, a book called Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, uh, where he he seeks to you know it, he basically applies the non-aggression principle to language and says you know almost all our language is in a domination paradigm where we're trying to dominate someone else and when listening is just waiting for them to finish so that we can tell them why they're wrong and we need to change that so uh so uh sorry i kind of lost my point there but um <laughs> what where were we going with that again uh my main question was if you if you were in power right and as we discussed you can't just turn it off overnight i was wondering if you had any had thought about uh, ways that you could start to slowly unwind through the political system uh, all of the problems of the political system uh, without causing too much horrible chaos for too many people. Right. Yeah. So I kind of went off on two or three different <laughs> sidetracks there. Um, but yeah, my, my main point is we need to see ourselves as powerful people, as physicians, as people being able to provide value. Uh, and you need to be able to practice this in your own life and then bring that into to the pub before you bring it into the public sphere and start connecting with people that you don't know. Uh, and so part of our role then as, as libertarians, if we, if we get into office, if people give us a monopoly of power is to solve this problem of addiction to the state, you know, and, and you don't do it by simply slapping the heroin away and saying no more heroin for you. Uh, it has to be done in a way that, that, uh, meets the people's needs that that gives them power that that allows them to start homesteading and getting ownership over their lives back. So, for example, uh, First Nations people, natives in in my area, uh, you know, I, I ran into some problems in my campaign because there was this uh, person in in Ontario who was running a very negative libertarian campaign, saying get get native people off the gravy train, kind of portraying them as a privileged class of people, which is which is I guess true in one sense, but to, to call a people in the most devastated communities of our country that are the victims of horrendous state power, uh, victims are, are, are privileged is kind of uh, crazy. Uh, and, and in my writing, I was promoting a message of empowerment. So I wanted First Nations people. So oil sands, giant oil sands corporations continually use this oligopoly uh, and collusion with government to get more and more of, of what I consider to be uh, the land of First Nations individuals, specific individuals in in that have been homesteading that land for their whole life, hunting, trapping, gathering food, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so my message was one of power. I want you to be connected with property rights. I want you to be able to say yes or no to an oil sands operation. I want you to be able to impose whatever kind of rules you want about development in your own land that meet environmental protection and all this other thing that's the way forward for the environment for the so it seemed like two very different messages so uh we need to think really hard about how we how we do that right so for example universal health care is something that that canadians just seem to love in fact one deputy mayor at a debate came up to the mic looked at me and said you can take my universal health care and pry it from my cold dead hands drops the mic crowd erupts and cheers and so it, it, yeah, it's, it's universal health care in canada just for people who don't know is like the uh, sort of the gun groups in the u.s that's how they think of it it's a strange uh, culture it is it's very <laughs> weird but you know and it's ridiculous i mean our lineups here are are, are you know six ten months long it, it's it's not you know it's every time i look at the hospital line it reminds me of bread lines in the soviet union um but you know we have, but but you know a normal reaction would be get to get very defensive and slap that person back and say universal healthcare is evil for X Y and Z, uh, and but but you have to find another gear. You have to recognize that this person is is feeling threatened. I mean something that he values that is sacred belief is is healthcare and the provision and being looked after and all. So you have to understand the underlying motive. And so so as a libertarian government what we would need to do then is is provide options for people to opt out we wouldn't be able to just take the heroin away but actually provide things of value and actually if you look at at uh you know places that that deal with drug addiction this is the kind of thing that they do as well they they provide they don't immediately would take the heroin away from them they they provide connect people with jobs connect people with power connect people with kind of liberty in their own lives 
And as they connect with liberty, they, the drug addiction takes care of itself and it kind of goes away and they realize that this is providing them the thing they need. So, so we need to be able to provide uh, private options for people, uh, create a climate that allows entrepreneurs to step in and provide value to people uh, and, and provide an alternate path. So that's kind of the way forward, uh, I think. And, and, you know, right now we're actually working on a document, uh, you know, we're, the working title is called The Plan to Restore Canada. And we're, we're looking to hook up with experts in all the different domains like First Nations, healthcare, um, immigration, all these kinds of things to figure out how we can unwind the tentacles of state power. One, one guy I met in Tokyo, a kind of a liberty activist there, had a great idea of, you know, maybe something as simple, something we could do tomorrow if we formed a libertarian government is have a tax uh, tax bill that shows people line by line exactly where their individual dollars are going. Like most people, a typical household in Fort McMurray pays about $33,000 a year into the healthcare system, but nobody knows that. They just assume that healthcare is free. Uh, and so what I would like to do is show them on their household thing, how much they're paying to each thing. And then if we implement a, a, a tax cut that we think we can sell, like say even just 2% and allow people to take it from whichever line item they want, well, now we can start sending market signals uh, into the market of which government programs people find more valuable and, uh, you know, and at the same time open up and start legalizing things like health care. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a firefighter paramedic by trade and it's illegal for me to start a fire department that competes or a, an ambulance service that competes uh, with my employer. Uh, so, you know, allowing, allowing uh, they're legalizing things like that, services that people would find valuable, I think would be a good first step. Yeah, I agree. And was that person in in Tokyo? Was that Mark Abello? Uh, he was there, but it was uh, actually another fellow that came along with him. Uh, he I can't remember his Stefan. Stefan was his name. He uh, he works at the Canadian Embassy there, and he's looking to to get out of uh, government and get into the private sector. So oh, good. Uh, come get, back to Canada. Get a real job. Good. Yeah, for him. yeah. <laughs> and 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 he's you know I he's very interested in running as a as a candidate, and that's a great way to get the message out there. And it's it's tough, man. It's like you're standing on stage in in enemy territory and your knees are going to shake and you're going to and and that's how you know you're in the right place in my opinion if you're feeling really uncomfortable but you know you're doing the right thing i think that's where the most fruit lies and and so i would encourage people out there that are involved in liberty activism to find you know use whatever gifts you have and go to whatever domain you can and and put yourself out there and uh and make yourself vulnerable that's the only way you're, we're going to increase this movement. You know, it's not sitting around in liberty circles arguing about minarchism versus anarchism versus uh, this or that. It, it's, it's actually getting out there and connecting people who need to be connected with this message. Totally. Totally agree. Um, why don't you let people know how they can help? Um, uh, for example, d does the Libertarian Party have, I don't think you even have like a person in every riding, do you? It's uh, fairly small. Is that right? Uh, not yet. No, we're working on that right now. So, you know, if you're if you're in Canada and you want to get involved in the party, uh, go to our website, libertarian.ca and uh, drop us a line. Become a member. I think it's only about 10 bucks or something like that. There's different levels of membership uh, that you know, are donation levels you can do. But you can get involved in the party right now today and uh, and, you know, send us a message. Say you want to get involved. And we're working right now to, to kind of organize ourselves and uh, create a, a scalable organization that uh, we can plug people into right away and get them, them working to, to spread this important message. That's great. And I think you're going to be surprised at how well it goes. Um, I'm sort of on the front lines for a while now of just seeing how things are changing. And uh, the U.S. is doing uh, different things. Uh, the Libertarian Party in the U.S. is definitely not uh, anywhere near anarchy at all. They're sort of a uh, uh, limited government sort of a party. Um, which is fine, it's better. Um, but uh, I think Canada uh, could, uh, just because I know, I know the way the people are there and what I said before, like they kind of don't mind these off the wall sort of crazy sort of ideas and trying things. And uh, one thing that I've always brought up, uh, at be, uh, having uh, been born in Canada and, and lived there till I was about 20, 28, um, is that I always laughed at the U.S. They always basically just have two parties. But in Canada, of course, there's all kinds of parties, uh, the, the NDP and Liberals and the Green Party and all kinds of things. And a lot of them get votes. And so I think there's a real chance for uh, the libertarian uh, style of a, a, a movement 
to happen uh, more in Canada at this moment in time than the U.S. And uh, I think you'll be surprised. And so just keep getting out there, keep spreading the message. And uh, for anyone watching this, if you live in Canada, uh, get involved. I think this cannot hurt our cause at all to get involved in everything Tim has said. I totally agree with, and it's not necessarily even about getting uh, votes. It's about getting the message out there. That's how we're going to change things. So um, maybe say one more time, Tim, where people can go and uh, donate or contribute or participate. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, just go to our website, libertarian.ca. Um, you know, that that's a great place to go. You can, you can look at, uh, you know, I can send you some links as well. Um, some of the uh, they're, they're, we have a YouTube channel. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I've done some writing in the past and have a blog spot. And actually, I, I blog uh, sometimes for the Huffington Post, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's it's a platform that I was given. I, I did some film work with uh, Neil Young a while ago when he was up in Fort McMurray. And then um, I kind of outed him as a hypocrite as when he kind of dis disparaged our community and our industry up here and uh, pointed out all the ways he was a hypocrite. Um, and then I got all this kind of national attention and the Huffington Post picked me up as a blogger. So I'm trying to figure out how to use that blog spot to promote liberty without getting kicked off the Huffington Post thing there. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I have a Huffington Post blog. I have another blog called fortmacphilosopher.blogspot.ca where I've talked about things like, uh, you know, how gun control might work in a free society. Uh, in a free market where there's no government and how, uh, you know, things like oil sands development might work and that sort of thing. Awesome. So, yeah, send me those links. We'll put them down in the links down below. And uh, like I said, support Tim in any way you can. I think it's great. And I think I have uh, quite a bit of hope for what's going to happen. We're going to see, though. And uh, so that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. Peace, love and anarchy. This is Anarchist.